Hi everyone, welcome to the guided tour. Um, it's not going to be so much of a traditional tour. Uh, it kind of is kind of not. I'm going to just talk to the three pieces here. The, um, the, basically, we're going to speak to the three pieces and then we're going to end, come back in to Philip's work, which is the hanging install. And we're going to do a Q&A. <laughs> well, not a Q&A, but I'm going to ask questions and you're all going to get a chance to answer. And it's about um, engaging you more with the artwork on a personal level and then back to what the artist is representing in the work. Um, yeah, so I'm Narendra Ghana. My background is actually working in Aboriginal health. I did that for 18 years. And then I kind of on the side started doing a lot of do-it-yourself kind of art um, nights, like spoken word, poetry, uh, queer parties, and also storytelling events. And then kind of built up enough courage to actually get a job in the arts. <laughs> and since then I've been doing a lot of um, programming and cur curatorial work. And um, so this is my first guided tour, which I'm really excited to do. So I have notes, so please bear with me. <laughs> but I wanted to start down here because this is actually my uh, favorite uh, piece. So this is Yuko uh, Mori. They're from, they're a Tokyo based artist and they create these incredible installations where they use sculpture, they use sound, but they use products, well not products, they use objects from everyday usage. So they're not really creating stuff, they're more assembling them together to create the sculpture. Um, this one is, <laughs> she also uses natural forces like magnetics, gravity, light, and temperature in her sculptural work. And um, yeah, like I said, using them from everyday objects. So. The story actually doesn't start here. The story of this work starts in these photographs. And Yoko, uh, Yo Yoko, sorry, I always say Yoko because of Yoko Ono. I'm a big fan. But <laughs> Yuko creates, uh, has been living in Tokyo and would often you know, use the underground uh, subway system. And they one day kind of realized that there was all these kind of plastic tunnel of uh, uh, funnels and contraptions that were propping up in the, the, the subway system. And they got, became fascinated with them and they learnt that there were actually leakages from the underground uh, water system that was leaking into the subways. And this was because the subways had been built in a very destructive manner in towards nature and were not sealed properly. <laughs> and therefore nature was starting to creep in. And as Yuko said in the Japanese polite culture, that instead of just having a bucket to drip into, they would create these funnels. So they would put the plastic up around with the leakages and then usually have this kind of tubing or they would create tubing with wrapping the plastic together like over here. And then they would, it would drip down into a container and then it would get emptied out. And in that, Yuku became really obsessed with them <laughs> and started taking photos. And this was done, has started since 2009 that she was doing this. And in that, she was just taking photos on her phone. She wasn't doing kind of professional photography because she, it would actually just happen as she was just traveling about in her day. She wasn't out hunting for them. They were just kind of as she came across them. She's now amassed thousands of photos of these, like, because she will take several photos of, of, each, um, of each funnel. And, and now is starting to kind of be inspired by that to uh, create sculptural work like this. So if we look at this, we actually see that she is replicating this system and she has the presence of nature and she also has the presence of man-made objects. So I love this because I feel like it's, it's a replication of how nature is alive as well as mankind is alive in what we're creating and how the two kind of intersect. 
She has taken all these objects and assembled them to create movement and sound, while also replicating the makeshift plastic funnels as well. So this can easily be dismantled and the objects can re be returned to what they were created for. Um, she also relies on natural forces, and in this one particularly water, and for the process of journey of water to keep moving, which is what's happening in the underground water system, is that even though we come in and build a concrete tunnel, the water around that is still moving. But really at the core of her work is a message around environmentalism and how we so what I like about this also is that everyone else kind of focuses on rivers and sea and stuff like that, where she's actually focusing on underground water, which kind of makes this a little bit unique. But she's kind of reminding us that no matter where we're going, we've got to be creating a balance, a balance between how we construct things as humans and, and respecting what is there, what is present in the nat natural world, even if it's meters and meters and meters below the ground. So um, one thing that she also highlights is, again, the makeshift response to environmental issues, because this is an environmental issue. It's about the underground water system and that it's not actually solving the problem. It's not addressing the, the issue that's taking place here. So this work, um, is by Imatai, and Imatai is, lives in um, Lampung in Thailand, which is northern Thailand, and they live in the um, Ping River Valley, which makes her a rural artist, which I think, as someone who lives in the country myself, which is actually being, I live out in Two Wells, and it's now being encroached by suburbia um, I really appreciate the voices of, of rural and remote artists. Also, I work at Country Arts. So. <laughs> but um, her mediums include hair weaving. Um, this is what she's uh, very well known for. And also she does drawings and craft. She always uses natural materials to incorporate into her work. And I want to point some of them out. Um, these are the bones of fish. This incredible piece, all these little, they look like drawings, but they're actually wings of termites. And she collected them because uh, where her studio is, the termites, when they mate, when it's mating season, they drop their wings. And so she collected them all up. And the same with the fish um, scales, sorry. She's collected them from along the river. And then the hair, which is all human hair. And she started doing this, um, what year was it? Sorry, I think it was like early in her career, about 20 years ago. Yeah, and then around 2009, she needed more hair. <laughs> so she started asking her friends and her family to donate their washed hair. And then she crochets it. And in this, for this art piece, they represent the little creatures that live in the river. So if we connect the, th the three, because there's actually three pieces of work. This is plankton. This is virus, which is also the full moon. And then this is star, which is made out of the fish scales. And what she's presenting here is a full moon by the river. So here is the river. Here is the creatures that are living in it. Here's the full moon, which has a really deep cultural significance for her, her culture. And then the stars. And if we actually look, they mirror each other as well, the stars. And I think it's, I mean, apart from the intricate detailing of this crocheted work, which would have taken hours and like I would have to have a magnifying glass to be able to see this. Really, these are such basic materials that she's using, but has used them in such an effective way. I, I would, 
if we could, but I don't think we can now, it would be great to turn the lights down. Is that possible? And I think it transforms the space and it actually starts to look like a night scene. So her process is that she lives along the Ping River. She told us about how people would throw their rubbish into the river. It became the dumping ground. And it was a greater, the greater story around that is how we as human beings are responsible for damage to riverways. And I think that here in Adelaide on Ghaniata, we can really resonate with that when we have the River Torrens that's constantly having algae, blo um, algae blooms. And our other rivers, apart from the Onkaparinka, the northern rivers are often dry most times of the year, like the Gawler River and the Sturt River and the Little Para River as well. And that's because of our interference with river systems. And they wanted to, to bring a high, they wanted to highlight that and bring that the damaging of, of our rivers. And one of the things that she wanted to really focus on was microplastics and how that's entering into um, the fish and, and river and sea life's bodies and the plants. And then how that enters our food chain via those animals. So not only are we damaging our environments, our rivers, the animals that live within them, but we're also now damaging ourselves because we've put this distance between ourselves and nature when really we are a part of nature. So she referred to that as choking, which I think is something that we've heard before around the choking of our river systems, literally choking the life out of them. Um, she does dismiss the notion that new innovation and technology is what is needed to solve the problem. And I agree with her because her stance is that we, and what she's calling for is immediate collective action. So we need to actually gather, regather, because we were gathered before as human beings, but through corporatization, we, we think about the individual needs as opposed to those of the collective. And we're all guilty of it. And it doesn't mean we can't have self-care. It means that we need to be thinking about collectiveness, but also not just ourselves as human beings, but the collectiveness of, of one, of nature. Um, so this was embedded in her practice. She worked with local sex workers in her community and together they make art and they also contributed to this piece as well. So she's asking uh, for us, I always asked each artist what was the message to take home and I've tried to weave that into each of it, but I wanted to state hers. And hers was to, for us to think beyond our individual needs and start thinking about our collective needs, which I think was really important. And I think that she's a person of her, of her word like I said, she uses natural materials. And I think that's very evident with the, with the human hair, that she's not relying on the manufacturing of new products. It's stuff that, it's bio-waste, <laughs> natural bio-waste <laughs> um, that she's picking up, collecting, and turning it into beautiful work and work about nature itself. So there is a cycle in that. And the hair particularly is a symbol of love. So people might turn their nose up at it because it's a, a body, uh, a, you know, a product of the body, but it actually is a symbol of love in her culture that people will you know, brush their hair, collect it and pass it on to her to make work. And she has made thousands of these. These are just a small selection of what Ace uh, could have actually <laughs> exhibited, but there's only so much space and time. And a big shout out to the install crew <laughs> for putting this one in. <laughs> so like I said before, the three pieces culminate into one piece, the moon in the center, the stars and the riverbed and how these all intersect uh, with the creatures swimming around. And I think it's really just such a beautiful space. From 
Alloway Kayumakan. And they're from the Paiwan Nation, which is the Pari Draran community, which is in southern Thailand. Uh, Taiwan, sorry. Uh, no, yeah, Taiwan, sorry. In, and they're an indigenous community. Um, she's also the chief's daughter. So I just want to put that out because that positions her within this, this work and within the collective, uh, the collective work and the drive of it. So in 2009, a ty uh, typhoon Morakot destroyed her village, displacing her community, and they were not allowed to return to live on that site as it had now been zoned a natural disaster site and that it could happen again. And so therefore the community could no longer live there. But after some time, they were allowed to return to the village and I guess begin their process of grief, uh, uh, healing their grief, sorry. And in that, um, Alloway decided that the, they wanted to create a piece of work but they knew that it had to be a collective piece of work. And so she gathered all the elder women who were 70 years plus, and she began this process and she followed the guidance of her elders as well. So it wasn't her telling them what to do because that's not gonna happen. <laughs> and she created an artistic uh, response or to the loss, to the grief and by through this collective process of healing. So they returned to the village with these pieces of material and with this ink that uh, she had made from native plants. And they would go through the village and they would rub uh, objects and surfaces with the ink and then rub it onto the material. And this was a process of not just collecting the memories of that community, but also by rubbing and doing this action, it was a process of healing for them as well. So in this piece, so, and then after they had collected the memories, this was several visits that they did, they uh, collectively again, stitched and wove uh, this work together and creating this piece. So not one piece of this, is created by an individual artist. It is actually created by a group of artists. Um, this, these weavings down here represent the clay urns that are significant in their culture. And the clay urns are, are a household piece that are gifted to people when they create a new household, so usually at marriage. And then that piece um, sits in your home and you, when you have children, the mother-in-law of the daughter or the wife will break a piece off her, her clay urn and would give it to her. So a piece of her urn then becomes a gift to her new daughter-in-law, an extension of family. So they're very significant, they're very important, and that is why they have replicated them and placed them in the center of, of this work. If you look around, you might be able to start to see some familiar um, shapes. And I think over here, there's uh, just up here, this bit that kind of sticks out and that bit in the corner. They're the pathways uh, that were still remained and they were able to capture the bricks and the memories of walking along them. Uh, there is household objects, um, looks like kitchen kind of ware stuff here but really, you know, we're never going to know the full breadth of what they captured because it's their memories that they're capturing. It was their household objects. There are some actual objects that you can see, like this here is a, uh, like a piece of clothing that they found. Um, they also found photographs um, in the village um, and were able to incorporate them into, into this piece. Yeah, if you just come along and you look, you can see more pathway here. I think this is some weaving that was uh, marked into the, the work. 
And, you know, there's things, like I said, that we're not going to know, but we know that they're significant. We know that they're, they're memories and they're objects that they have to leave behind, which is, it's quite a sad piece, but it's also like you feel the healing within this, every, how they're stitching their memories together to hold on to memory. That's what I feel. And I think it's a beautiful thing because it's out of this disaster, they were still able to hold on together as a community. And that's what was more important than, than the village. Hmm. So again, her, her message was one that echoed, I think, really um, through uh, Imitai's work, that it's about collective hope, collective resistance, but most importantly, collective work. That is what brought this piece together. And, and it hold, it's what holds them as a community together, even though they've relocated somewhere else. The community lives on. I think it also could uh, represent the chaos of, of the natural disaster that hit their, their community, but also a representation of the, the rubble that was left behind and that they had to sort through. I really didn't know what to think of this when I saw it. I was like, it's stunning, it's beautiful, but what is it? And when I got to do a little diving in, I found out that these stitchings are actually the, um, what they call lalava. And it's a type of stitching and binding um, of two kind of things. They would bind like the ends of their canoe with it, or they would use it to build structures. So it was the, they would bind the wood together to create the structure of the house or the dwelling. And they're very important because they're actually encoded with stories. So each pattern is a different story. So Philippe, some of this does have stories encoded in them. Some of them are more kind of decorative. And it used to be made um, with coconut fibers, but now it's um, for this purpose, he used wool. And so he could use a variety of colors as well. And this is not traditional to have to do these cylinders and to hang it like this. This is his contemporary, you know, the bringing of the contemporary into, into that, uh, like the melding of contemporary and traditional. And I just, then once I found that out, it really blew my mind <laughs> that these, that there are stories actually encoded in the patterns that were, the symbols are a reminder of the steps within a story. And he says, my work transforms the technology of the past into a modern representation of identity and experience. By using the patterns established by Lalava, I express a Polynesian heritage with metaphors that speak to the, to the entire community. So, um, I can never pronounce this word. I was hitting the Google pronunciation button over and over. But they're meno mnemonic. Mnemonic. Am I saying it right? Mnemonic. mnemonic. Yes. Which is again what I was saying. It's creating symbolism uh, to re record a story, and then you can recount that kind of life story or life cycle by following those symbols. And so those symbols would be those stories would be used will be recorded in things like the canoe, for instance. So there would be the stories related to canoes and to fishing and to creation stories of men traveling. And we know Polynesian culture, there is a lot of migration, a beautiful history of migration across the Pacific. And that's captured in creation stories, which was then recorded in these patterns and then used in their canoes. So it's just this beautiful cycle again and utilizing the actual things that you're doing, you're recording the ancient stories attached to them. They're embedded in the creation of, of the canoe. So 
Um, and, and of course, these stories were passed down through culture. So he, he does use some of the coconut fibers, but um, he mostly uses wool, but that's for him a mixture, of, again, of the contemporary and the traditional. So, yeah, thank you all for coming along, and I hope you learnt a little bit more about all these beautiful pieces of work. And also to kind of, like, when you go into galleries, and I'm guilty of this, to not just sit and look at work, but actually sit with it and think how you are connecting with it, how it makes you feel, how it makes you think, and what is it that the artist is trying to say. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.